the way. Thank you, Ryan, for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, so yeah, as Ryan said, I'll talk about the measurement-based quantum information processing. This talk is meant to be uh, quite accessible, so I'll have quite a bit of background. Some things might be uh, well known to some of you, but hopefully uh, uh, people will also learn something new. So I'll start with some motivating examples uh, to see how the presence of entanglement followed by measurement can give uh, important primitives in quantum information processing. I will introduce graph states and then talk about their applications, namely in measurement-based quantum computing where they first appeared. And then uh, measurement-based uh, quantum networks, specifically repeaters. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll end with more kind of physical considerations of how these states can be generated. All right, so let's start. Uh, I'm guessing everybody's familiar. I'm assuming everybody's familiar with the concept of entanglement and uh, the Bell states. So this is one of the Bell states. And of course you cannot write it as a product state of uh, two different qubits. So these are inherent quantum correlations that exist in the state. They cannot be mimicked classically. And uh, of course, entanglement is an important resource in uh, quantum information processing. So I'll be using a lot the schematic here. At this point, you can view this as a cartoon. In a few slides, there will be a rigorous definition of a state like this. But anytime you see a circle that represents a qubit, and anytime you see a line, uh, that represents a particular type of entangling gate that has been applied uh, between those qubits. All right, so a very important concept in quantum information processing, especially in quantum networks and quantum repeaters, is the idea of entanglement swapping. And what entanglement swapping is, is that in the simplest case, you have two Bell pairs uh, shown here. So I have four different qubits and they're entangled pairwise. So the orange is entangled with the purple, the blue is entangled with the green, and then you bring together one qubit from each pair and make a joint Bell measurement. So from a physics point of view, if you want to think about what is this Bell measurement, uh, if these are spins, you can think about measuring the total spin of this uh, two qubit system in the middle and the spin projection, which would collapse, um, uh, uh, collapse you at least in uh, some of the Bell pairs. And then if uh, you manage to do that, then of course these two collapse into the measurement basis you chose. And the other two now have become entangled. So even though this orange and green represented qubits have never physically interacted directly, they have uh, become entangled through the entanglement they shared before the measurement with uh, two different qubits and the joint Bell measurement. Now, uh, this of course has been uh, demonstrated experimentally. This was a very impressive experiment at uh, Delft in uh, Ron Hansen's group where they demonstrated entanglement swapping between, um, and, and the creation of entanglement between two different MV centers, one in lab A and one in lab B. These, as you see in this aerial picture, are separated by more than a kilometer. And photons that were sent in C from each of these labs were um, measured in a Bell, Bell basis over here. And A and B, which never interacted, uh, uh, became entangled. And then they proceeded to, um, to do work on a Bell inequality violation, uh, et cetera. So um, mathematically, you can view entanglement swapping the following way. And the reason I uh, say mathematically is because there's different ways you can make this measurement physically. But mathematically, you can always map the projection onto the four, each of the four Bell states as follows. So this uh, C naught and Hadamard over here, I'm also assuming these are familiar gates, um, are used to convert the computational basis shown here into the Bell basis shown on the left-hand side. So even though this is, might not be what we always do experimentally in order to carry out a Bell measurement, mathematically you can view it like an entangling gate, the C naught in this case, uh, you could view this whole thing as an entangling gate followed by a single qubit measurement on each of the two qubits, right? So this um, kind of yellow mustard color here indicates uh, um, computational basis measurement. 
So what does that mean? If I look at my two entangled uh, bellpers here, and I do a C naught between these middle guys, there's this intermediate stage, at least from a mathematical point of view, where I have four entangled qubits instead of having uh, two at any given time. And then I'm doing a single qubit measurement at the stage. So you see, if I start from this middle point over here, um, I have this four qubit entangled state, and I make single qubit measurements only in these middle qubits, and that propagates the entanglement out into the uh, outer qubits, which were never directly entangled with the gate. So this is kind of one way to see how uh, multi-qubit entangled states can be, uh, together with single qubit measurements, can uh, lead to a, a different entangled states between qubits that never necessarily directly interacted with each other. Another example is the idea of a gate stop rotation. Uh, I'll, I'll give a particular um, aspect of it or a particular uh, example of it, which kind of leads to measurement based quantum computing. So consider one qubit in some arbitrary state, which I have represented here by arbitrary coefficients alpha and beta and a qubit in this well-defined state, which is uh, the plus one eigenstate of uh, x, probably x. And now I do a CZ gate between them. If I do that, I'm going to get the state shown over here, which in general will be entangled. And the next thing we want to do is measure the first qubit in some basis. So I choose this basis to be in the xy plane of the block sphere. Uh, by phi away from x. And if I make this measurement, uh, then the second qubit, um, so I measure the first one, the second qubit, um, sorry, uh, collapses into this state shown over here. So what you see is that the choice of measurement basis on the first qubit acted as a gate on the second qubit. And I can ask what is that gate? And I can write it down as follows. So what happened is the, the state moved in some way from the first to the second qubit and underwent this particular uh, transformation, this unitary gate. And this gate, what is it? It's a um, Z gate by phi followed by a Hadamard, because you see zero and one has turned into plus um, and minus. And moreover, there's this X gate that may or may not need to be applied depending on what the first uh, qubit outcome gave, right? Because you see there's this minus sign, which of course we get by applying X to this guy over here. And this is the place where the randomness of measurement appears, right? When we make the measurement on the first qubit, we don't know, of course, what the outcome we're going to get. There's this randomness inherent in measurement in quantum mechanics. And that translates into having uh, a gate over here that we cannot predict up front. But even though we cannot predict it up front, once we measure the first qubit, we do know uh, what it is, right? So we do know M. So even if we don't, we cannot predict it, we know uh, after the fact what it is and we can uh, compensate for it. So this is how you could do a single qubit gate or one particular single qubit gate on a qubit using an entanglement and single qubit measurement. All right, so hopefully with these motivating examples, we can move uh, to uh, graph states and see, and kind of have a little bit of a sense of why more uh, qubits would need to be entangled to do less trivial things. So, uh, I'm going to define uh, graph states. And first I'll define them in a, let's say, constructive way. So a graph state is a multi-qubit state, which is entangled, and which can be expressed as a graph in the following way. So anytime you write down a graph, circles are qubits, lines are uh, entangling gates. And this is a very precise mathematical definition. So each qubit, is put in state plus, which is the eigenstate uh, with eigenvalue plus one of the x poly. And the line is a CZ gate, which is shown over here, which is of course an entangling gate. So if I give you a graph now and I tell you these two rules, 
you can write down in principle any wave function, um, you know, the wave function corresponding to that graph I gave you. Of course, you don't, you might not want to do that for more than say four qubits because uh, this gets uh, a very, becomes very long, very fast. It's a superposition of all the basis states. And uh, the reason this uh, graph states have become well known or uh, um, quite famous is based because of the seminal paper by Rasmus and Briegel about 20 years ago now, where they showed that if you have a resource that has this form, this uh, two dimensional uh, square lattice form, which of course doesn't have to be a physical lattice, the lights are just entanglement, the qubits can be physically located in principle anywhere you like. If you have such a resource, you can do universal quantum computing, and I'll try to talk and motivate more uh, why that is the case. So in addition to this constructive definition I gave over here, you can have a more uh, formal definition, which is actually very useful in manipulating and understanding properties of these states. So any n qubit graph is actually the simultaneous eigenstate with eigenvalue one of the following n commuting operators. So for every vertex, you have an x Pauli denote over here. And then uh, you tensor that with z uh, Paulis on the neighbors. So for example, if I focus on this one over here, this would be x uh, here and three z's because this has three neighbors on these three qubits respectively. And then we have one such operator for each vertex. Okay, so let's now try to understand a little bit more why that is the case. And to do that, I will introduce a little bit, uh, just give a little bit more on the stabilizer formalism. So this is a formalism that's very useful in quantum information. It's used all over quantum error correction, measurement-based quantum uh, computing. And uh, the definition is basically what I gave you before. A stabilize, uh, operator stabilizes a state. If when you apply on it, you get back that state with eigenvalue one plus one. And some simple examples, if I have a single qubit, of course, there's just one. And I'm, I'm not uh, bothering to count the identity here. So I have just one of these. In the case of plus, of course, this is the eigenstate of x. So I have this one stabilizer. This is a pretty trivial example. A less, slightly less trivial is two qubits. So let's look at these two polys. So anytime I have a poly string, I can check commutation by looking at in how many places they fail to commute. If that's an odd number, I'm sorry, if that's an even number, uh, they commute. So these two commute, they, they don't commute in two places. And this operator, it's easy to check that it stabilizes the state because ZZ doesn't change anything. It just uh, picks up the eigenvalues and here you have minus one square and X flips zero to one. So it preserves the state. And there's other examples of stabilizer states uh, Bell state, GHZ states, uh, stabilizer, quantum error correcting codes, and the graph and cluster states, of course, which are the, the, the topic of this talk. Uh, one, uh, since the GHZ states are quite well known, let me just give you a feel of how they look in the graph formalism. So to turn them into um, graph states, you need to actually do some single qubit gates on them. So GHZ states are locally equivalent to star graphs, where you see you have selected a qubit here. You do some non, non not the same operation on all qubits, so that there's a central one in, in the graph sense. And but then they look like stars. So any GHZ state can be put in this form where there's just one um, kind of what only one here. There's not this this chain is no longer than one. So you just add more uh, arms uh, by adding qubits. Okay, so now how do stabilizers look for graph states? Let's uh, start uh, from the constructive definition I gave earlier. So we said we start from all pluses and let's call that uh, Psi naught. So this is our sort of initial state before we get the graph. And obviously this is stabilized by doing X on each qubit separately. So I have N X polys, one on each qubit. So I can write down this uh, stabilizer uh, operator equation over here. And what I do next is I follow my constructive definition. So I do a CZ gate and let's say I do it, I begin by doing it. I can do this simultaneously because I commute, but let's begin by doing them on two neighboring qubits. 
So if I do a uh, CZ gate on qubit one and two, uh, I of course get the graph state by definition because we said the graph state is doing CZ gates on this guy. So here I get one graph state, right? Only two qubits are connected. And then I do the CZ gate on this uh, C naught. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take um, this equation and I'm going to insert a CZ gate because CZ squares to identity uh, in the end of this, uh, before, right before C naught, right? But I know that CZ on C naught is just G naught, this graph I defined over here. And you, you see now that I have found a new stabilizer operator, which is just my original operator, which was X, conjugated by CZs on qubit one and two. So I can use now um, equivalence relations of uh, operators. And I'm using the fact that if I conjugate an X gate by CZs, where I'm assuming, of course, this X gate uh, involves one of the, the CZ gate involves one of the uh, qubits that the X uh, is acting on, then I get this X uh, tensor Z. And then, of course, that way we see that the stabilizer, at least for these two qubits that I uh, entangle in a graph state, is XZ, and of course, identity on the others. But you can follow the same procedure and find the stabilizers for everything, which uh, gives me, uh, I'm sorry, I should have said that here, which gives me um, the fact that the stabilizers are X on every vertex and Z on each of the neighbors, as we talked about a few slides ago. All right, so let's look at some examples to start getting familiar with this. As I said, it's not really useful. I mean, it's, it's not really practical to write a state beyond a certain number of qubits, but for a small number of qubits, we can. So let's do that. And I'm using, I'm mixing plus and minus spaces here because it makes my state look much more compact. So uh, for three qubits, I have uh, this linear graph. I can write it down as such. It's uh, these are the three stabilizers. So as I said, X on each one, Z for its neighbor. This middle guy has two neighbors. So the stabilizer looks different from the other two. Um, and you can see, uh, uh, sorry, before I go to that, I I'm gonna examine this more in a few slides, but uh, let I, I should say that stabilizers are very useful uh, in graph state, form in graph state um, manipulations. So you can find the effect of transformations and measurements using the stabilizers. And uh, to learn more um, about stabilizer formalism, you can look, of course, in Nielsen Chuang and then uh, Gottesman's thesis as well. And, then, and um, the stabilizer formalism is also very useful in building in error protection and loss tolerance. I'll talk about that uh, a few slides down. OK. So we had one quick question in the chat. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, is, is any quantum state locally equivalent to a graph state? No. No, there's a, uh, uh, it's actually uh, the number of graphs, states that can be represented as graphs is um, very, very small. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so one important thing to note, it's tempting to think that by looking at a graph, you can eyeball how much entanglement there is there. Or in another way to say that is how much, how many entangling gates do I need to create a graph, a particular graph? But actually that's not also not true because locally equivalent graphs, so graphs that can be connected to each other with single qubit gates can have different number of edges and in general will. So let's look at a very simple example where these two look topologically different in the sense that the edge qubits here have been connected in this right-hand side. And here it appears like I only need to do two CZ gates, whereas here I only need to do, I need three. But in fact, these two are locally equivalent. So you know, if you were, wanted to build the state on the right-hand side, you're probably much better off in most physical platforms creating this state and then doing a single qubit gate. So uh, this kind of connects to the idea of local complementation. So local complementation is a graph theoretic idea. And I'll show you more schematically in a few slides, but the definition is that you pick a node. So you local complementation is defined with respect to a node and you go to its neighbors 
and you remove the edges between those neighboring nodes if ex they exist, and you connect them if they didn't exist. So that's something that is, was known in graph theory before uh, graph states in the context of quantum uh, appeared. But in particular in quantum uh, graph states, local complementation is equivalent to local Clifford gates. So you can actually pick a graph and do exhaustively local complementation. And then all the graphs you obtain are in some sense you know, connected to each other. And we call that an orbit of the graph. And there's a nice paper from uh, many years ago now that uh, it shows an algorithm that you can check in an efficient way uh, equivalence. If you have two particular graphs, you can check whether they're LC equivalent or not. So I'm, I'm mentioning this. One, because it's uh, an important primitive, and two, because it's going to appear uh, a few slides down. So this is an example of an orbit of a four qubit linear cluster state. So we start from one, two, three, four, uh, the way we defined. And then if I do a series of local complementations, I can get all these possible graphs. By the way, this is a really nice paper. Uh, it's a very long paper where they talk about entanglement graph states. Uh, it's a very good resource to learn more about these things. Okay, so let's now uh, look at linear cluster states of various lengths, just to get a little bit more intuition. We already saw the three qubit uh, GHZ state, which can be expressed like this. Uh, it, this is locally equivalent to a three qubit GHZ, which is hopefully obvious by staring at this form and seeing that if I do a Hadamard on the first and the third qubit, I can get the uh, uh, GHZ as it's usually defined but it is distinct from W states, which are not graph states. So I cannot, uh, sorry, I didn't, by the way, I'm not normalizing my states here. Uh, that's all, uh, hopefully not a problem. So there's, uh, this is a distinct type of uh, entanglement from this, meaning that I cannot go from one to another by doing single qubit gates. Another thing to mention is that uh, for these particular states I wrote down here, there exists a single qubit measurement that destroys all the entanglement. So not only the entanglement in the qubit I measured, which of course will be the case if I'm making a single qubit measurement, but it also destroys the entanglement of the remaining qubits. And that's generic in a multi-qubit GHZ state. I can always measure in the computational basis and destroy the whole entanglement. That's why that GHZ state is also called the CAT state. It's a very kind of uh, sensitive state from a point of view of interacting with the environment and having the entanglement destroyed. Now let's look at the four qubit linear cluster state. So here you see, you can see it by eye, but it's also true that this is now distinct from a GHC state. Sorry, this should be four qubit here. Sorry, guys. So this one is inequivalent to the star uh, that I showed you before, or the version of the star that would apply here. And one way you could see that is that um, for the GHC state, four qubit GHZ, I can measure on the computational basis, all entanglement is killed. For this guy over here, there, there's no measurement, like there's no one single qubit measurement that can kill all entanglement. So already from the four qubit uh, linear cluster, you see there's this uh, more robust sense to the entanglement that uh, lives in the system. Okay. So what happens under measurements? So let's look at, uh, just to get a little bit more familiarity, if I look at the first, sorry, let's look at the last qubit. So because of the way I wrote it here, of course, this is a very symmetric state, so I could have uh, just uh, switched. Let's look at the last qubit. If I measure the last qubit in the computational basis, then I'm collapsing into the first and third term over here. And you see that this is equivalent um, to a, a three qubit, uh, cluster state or three qubit GHZ state. And that it doesn't matter which one I measure, but if, if uh, which outcome I get, but if I got the one outcome, you see I would have to do some corrective gates on uh, the remaining qubits, in this case, qubit three. Now, if I measure on the X basis, I'm picking uh, qubit one for that uh, thought experiment because qubit one is expressed in a convenient way for that. Then qubit two also separates because plus and zero um, uh, appear together here. And then I get a two qubit uh, graph state or a two qubit, uh, a bell state. 
So this is one example where I cannot just measure one qubit and destroy all of the entanglement. And it's true that Pauli measurements on stabilizer states will always uh, leave behind a stabilizer state on the unmeasured qubits. So let's look a little bit more uh, into how these states uh, act under measurement. So for Z uh, basis measurement, what happens is the, Z, the, the qubit that's measured is removed from the graph, but the structure of the rest of the graph remains intact. So this is a very special type of measurement because I can just generate, you know, other types of simple types of graphs with one qubit removed quite easily, but just removing uh, one and not destroying the, the structure of the graph. There would be in general Pauli byproduct gates by doing this measurement. So there would be some Z gates acting on these qubits, but the structure would not change. Uh, now, if I make a Y measurement, this is where local complementation comes in. If I make a Y measurement, then I'm removing from the graph the qubit I measured, of course. And then I go to its direct neighbors. So I look at these two. And I see in this example, they did not share a line. So I have to go and put a line according to the local complementation rule. If, on the other hand, they already shared the line as shown here, uh, I would have to go and remove it. So the Y axis measurement does change the way the graph kind of looks. Um, but there's a simple rule for it. And now the x-axis measurement is actually more complicated, so I'm not going to attempt to go uh, over the details. You can read uh, you can read about that in this Hein et al. paper I showed a few slides ago. Uh, but there's a nice thing that happens if I measure two neighboring uh, qubits in x basis, which is called contraction. So these, of course, are removed, but then their neighbors become connected. So you get a structure like this. And this is used in things I'll talk about later. So uh, graph states are, are, uh, are uh, non, get non-trivial evolution, more non-trivial evolution under non-Pauli measurements, which generally don't preserve, uh, uh, doesn't preserve the structure like Pauli measurements do. And they lead to generalized rotations on the remaining qubits. So let me show you uh, what I mean by that, which would lead us to measurement-based quantum computing. So let me uh, also try to motivate this with a simple example. So we have, in this example, I'm going to assume I have some state, uh, which is uh, more general than the plus state. So I'm assuming I'm inputting some single qubit state here. And the rest are in the standard plus, so I kept this green color I'm using, and I used blue to indicate that this state starts in some arbitrary state. This qubit starts in some arbitrary state. And what we want to do, our goal, is to end up with a rotation on the information that remains, which is going to be in one uh, last qubit. So my goal here is to implement um, this rotation by some arbitrary axis, uh, an arbitrary angle phi acting on the state C. And we're going to be making use of the other angle of decomposition. So I'm assuming this is a known thing where I can decompose an arbitrary single qubit gate uh, by introducing two axis rotation and three arbitrary angles. All right, so let's see what happens. So I'm introducing a measurement in the xy plane. So this is, uh, means pi half away from the z axis and phi away from the x axis. And I'll use this, this uh, notation over here to indicate that. So this means away from z, this means away from x. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure each qubit sequentially in um, the basis indicated here. So what changes from qubit to qubit is how far away this uh, measurement axis is from x. And what happens is that, of course, all qubits get disentangled because now I'm measuring each one, uh, doing a single qubit measurement on each one. And if we see, we go and we see what happened to the state of the last qubit, which is the one I'm interested in, because that's where the information has propagated. These measurements turn out to be equivalent to this gate over here. So the first rotation that a C undergoes is a Z rotation by phi, phi one. The second one now, you see there's this M1 over here. So M1 is uh, the random measurement outcome that I got by measuring the first qubit. So it could be zero or one, depending on the eigenvalue. And that means that 
the second rotation now got modified because of this randomness of the first uh, measurement. Similarly, the third uh, measurement or the third effective rotation got modified by the outcome of the second measurement. And I also have this Hadamard uh, byproduct as well as these X and uh, Z polys. Here, actually, I've already used uh, commutation relations of uh, X and Z to move these all these gates to the left. And you can actually always do that, which is a nice feature because that means that I don't have to physically compensate for these. I can always just account for them as a classical post-processing. So one important thing here is that, you know, if my goal was to do phi two over here, obviously this exact recipe I showed you is not gonna work because I need to account from, for this measurement, uh, the probabilistic nature of the measurement. But what I can do is after I make the first measurement, I know the outcome. So instead of measuring the second guy in this basis, I can modify this by minus phi two. And if I do that, then I have the gate I wanted over here and so on. So uh, this summarizes everything I told you. Um, the measurement outcome on qubit J affects the rotation. Uh, oops, I think something's cut here. Uh, induced by the measurement. And we compensate by uh, adapting, uh, feeding forward to the J plus one qubit uh, measurement basis. So this is a classical feed forward. I don't, it, there's no quantum sense in this. It just changes some classical setting. And uh, as I mentioned, the polys don't need to be executed. So this is doable so long as your experimental system has the capability of quickly changing basis, me measurement basis. So this information needs to be fed into through your uh, electronics into the next uh, uh, measurement that's about to happen. Okay, you can also do two qubit gates this way. So I'm not going to go into great detail in this because I want to show you also some other applications. But um, there's uh, this is one example of how you can do C0 gate. So if you have a state like this, then you can do Y and X gates. And the outcome over here is whatever the income, uh, incoming state was. The blue ones are always indicating a different state. Some arbitrary state C could be entangled or not. And here I end up with C not acting on C. And this can generalize by uh, patching together these different types of twin gates into actually doing computation. So uh, the original paper is this PRL. There's this follow-up PRA, which is a quite long paper and explains things very clearly, where you can see that you can get um, an arbitrary computation by having this resource state that I talked about earlier on, this uh, two-dimensional grid, and following the rules we just discussed for doing uh, um, single qubit gates and C naught. And one thing, of course, you would notice here that this is a quite uh, greedy um, a way of doing it in terms of number of qubits. So you need more qubits than you would need in a, in a uh, circuit-based model. And here's a comparison. So I should have had the same number here. Sorry about that. Uh, I should have used the same number of qubits to indicate that. But the way you can view um, the comparison of circuit model and cluster model is, of course, in the circuit model, you start in a product state. You do single and two qubit gates, which are unitary. So entanglement is created dynamically during the computation. And then you read out your state with single qubit measurements. In the cluster model we've been talking about, you have all your qubits entangled up front, and there's no um, dynamic creation of entanglement during your algorithm. And then everything, your whole computation, relies on single qubit measurements with this classical feed forward, where you're uh, consuming this entangled state, and then the very last kind of um, the last uh, column of qubits that remains is actually what would correspond to your qubits at the final time of the algorithm in the circuit model. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so you, you can see already here that you need many more qubits here because essentially qubits correspond to time steps in the one dimension. Okay, so there's um, interesting things to think about. So one thing you could uh, worry about is that since you need to create all this entanglement, you might worry that you need to preserve all this entanglement while you're measuring the early qubits. 
But what is nice is that you don't need to create the whole thing at once and then measure. You can actually create your uh, cluster state as you are measuring. So, so long as you're a few uh, kind of bonds away from where the computation is happening, then you can be creating the state dynamic. And the, the, the uh, approach of creating all the entanglement up front is actually uh, attractive for physical systems where the entangling gates are probabilistic. And I'll talk about that in the remaining time. Uh, and that's the case, of course, in photonic uh, quantum information processing. Another thing is that measurements need to be fast compared to coherence. And the electronics have to be fast to implement the speed forward. So in terms of physical systems, the two physical systems where this has been uh, either proposed or attempted the most are photonic systems. And this is the most prevalent place where measurement-based quantum computing um, appears. And the reason is that two qubit gates are probabilistic. Entanglement can be generated offline if they're probabilistic, you know, if you got them. And um, single qubit measurements are easy and you can do the feed forward. Another place where they have been proposed is atomic lattices, where the native interaction is of Ising type. So uh, they're attractive in that sense. All right, there's been some experimental demonstrations. This list is by no means exhaustive. Uh, there's been some uh, a lot of photonic work. This is just some, some uh, choices. There's been an experiment where they showed a 12 superconducting qub qubit linear cluster state. And more recently, people are playing around with these um, IBM quantum processors where you can also try to do these things yourself. Okay, so the challenges in actually creating a photonic graph states are the, th the fact that the two qubit gates are probabilistic. So to create the cluster state, you have to try many times uh, to do that. And the dominant error is that photons can be lost. And these are generic challenges. So, so long as you only use linear optics, uh, Bell measurements are probabilistic or uh, entangling gates are probabilistic. And uh, uh, there's also a, a attenuation length in any fiber you propagate photons where they will be lost at some point. So how do you do Bell state measurement in, in photons? Uh, this is the classic setup over here. So you have uh, the photon, each photon coming in from a different port. You have a, a beam splitter. You have polarizing beam splitters. And you can show that this setup over here maps uh, the four different bell pairs in this way. So H indicates um, horizontal polarization, V indicates um, uh, vertical polarization, and one and two indicates which mode. So uh, which out of these two modes. So what you see is, <coughs> excuse me, is that in this case over here where the two photons end up in the same polarization, same mode, you cannot tell them apart. Whereas here they end up in, <coughs> excuse me, in the same uh, mode, but different polarizations. So you can separate out polarizations. And here they end up in different um, modes. So in these two cases, you can distinguish them. So that's why these measurements, at least with a simple setup over here, can only succeed 50% of the time because 50% of the time you don't know which of these you have. So there's this fundamental limit and there exist more elaborate schemes that I'm not going to talk about now on how to try to increase this success probability. And then there's the issue of uh, photon laws. So you can actually protect against that. And there's this really nice paper from uh, the Rudolph's group from many years ago now, where they define these um, tree structure. So this whole thing denotes one logical qubit. And this graph has been um, designed in a way that protect, protects against uh, photon loss. And you can uniquely define this by defining the branching ratio and the depth. So how many uh, branches do you have and uh, at, at each level and how many levels. And this has a loss tolerance threshold of 50%. And we can understand why by looking at the stabilizers. So let's say I have this uh, structure that I showed you. And I want to make a, a Z measurement on this qubit over here. But let's assume that this qubit is lost. I still have these qubits here. I know that if I measure X and Z over uh, in this qubit, uh, then I should have that the product of 
uh, the outcome of this, these measurements together with this one that's missing should be one. And the same thing should happen, uh, let's say between these three. So by actually just measuring uh, photons that made it, I can deduce what this would have been if I had access and measured. Of course, here's, here I'm assuming that there's no Pauli errors that have happened on these or the lost qubit. But this way I can actually recover information about a photon that's been lost. And I cannot, of course, uh, get things for free. So one, I need to create this thing somehow. And two, I cannot tolerate arbitrarily high uh, uh, loss. So before I move on to uh, the next application, which is quantum networks, I just want to leave you with some uh, additional reference. I just presented the very basics of a measurement-based quantum computing. Uh, there is a 3D version of cluster state which builds in fault tolerance. There's other lattices you can use be, be, uh, beyond just the square 2D lattice. Uh, and people have been looking at uh, some condensed matter physics uh, connections there. There's a diff percolation. You don't need the perfect uh, lattice, 2D lattice. There could be qubits missing, and you can still do computation so long as you have a percolated path. And there, more recently, just a few, I think a month or two ago, uh, PsyQuantum put out a paper they call uh, on, a, on a scheme they call fusion based quantum computing, which is a variation on the measurement based uh, quantum computing scheme I've been talking about. All right, so let me just uh, spend my next five or so, uh, five to 10 minutes talking about measurement based uh, photonic repeaters. About 15 minutes left, Sophia. Oh, okay, even better. All right. So here we uh, are focusing on quantum networks. And of course, in a reality, we want to create quite elaborate quantum networks that we can share quantum information on a global scale. But before we become that ambitious, what we would like to do is have Alice and Bob who are separated by more than what um, an, an optical fiber allows you to share without attenuation. And uh, we want to somehow to allow them to, or to enable them to share an entanglement using photons, even though uh, we have this problem that fibers um, attenuate uh, photons, so photons are absorbed. Classically, what you can do is you can measure the signal and amplify it. Quantum mechanically, of course, you cannot do that because measurement destroys the state. And the solution to that is the well-known uh, uh, construction of quantum repeaters. So uh, the idea is that you concatenate entanglement swapping. So you have Alice and Bob over here. I denote them by these three-level atomic system. And the idea is that they can emit a photon that is entangled with their atomic system here, and we call this an, a quantum memory because it needs to store information long enough while all these entangling uh, gates succeed. So um, what happens here is that each of these atomic memories emits a photon. Uh, you send the photon in some intermediate node, so you cut the distance. You make a Bell measurement here. If this Bell measurement succeeds, and this Bell measurement, let's say here, succeeds, then you can go and make a bell measurement between the two memories. So now you see that you have used the idea of entanglement swapping in a repeated way. And concatenated in that way, you can actually entangle Alice and Bob. So the basic primitive here is, of course, entanglement swapping. Uh, we already saw this. But we all also saw that in the case of uh, photons, this is a probabilistic operation. So 50% of the time, this will work. The rest, it won't. One thing you can do is you can concatenate the scheme. So you can have many different quantum memories, some photons. When this succeeds, uh, you're notified. And then you selectively entangle and swap between the memories that uh, had uh, successful uh, Bell state measurement events. Uh, but you can also try to do something else, try to use uh, the properties of graph states um, to, to, to do this without the need of quantum memories at all, actually. So in this paper that came out about six years ago, this idea was put forward. So at each node, you generate a photonic entangled state, a graph state that has this form. Now that we went through um, definition and construction of graph states, we know what the state looks like, right? We could, in principle, write it down as a wave function. And then what you do is you send half of these photons to 
the left neighboring node and the other half to the right neighboring node. And you see that there's nothing remaining at the node where you generated these, the stick. And the fact that there's these arms sticking out means that I have multiple uh, opportunities to try a bell state measurement. So that at the hope is that if the state is large enough, at least uh, one will succeed with uh, asymptotically uh, unit probability. So this is how uh, the network would look like in a schematic way. Um, these are the state preparation nodes I talked about before. I denote them by blue. I'm assuming all the photons were generated here for this particular graph. I, uh, half are sent one way, the other half the other. And you see there's another node over here. And then we have these measurement nodes in the middle where we can make bell state measurements. And again, since these are probabilistic, let's just assume that one of them succeed, succeeded and these might have failed or I might have actually not even attempted them yet. So as soon as this one succeed, then what do I want to do? Now I want actually the entanglement to spread out uh, left and right wise. And I don't want locally to have any uh, states. So what I do is I go and I make measurements. So one thing I need to do is get rid of any qubits that are not in my path where I want to entangle. So these qubits now are not useful because they're, the bell measurements corresponding to their arms sticking out either didn't succeed or are not going to be attempted at all. And now what I need to do is I need to look at this path and remove the qubits that are within this path but in a way such that the entanglement spread out and not destroyed. And we already saw um, which measurements do that. These are X measurements. And particularly I can do these, uh, if I do X measurement in each of these, I do this contraction that I talked about uh, several slides above. And that means that I'm spreading the entanglement out. And the same thing happens in the neighboring measurement nodes, et cetera, et cetera. So this allows us to actually create one uh, entangled pair be between the very end node on one side and the other. And what's interesting here is that there's no need for classical signaling between nodes because all the information is now local over here and local over here. And all the measurements, we know what this node with measure measurements we need to do. And we have this redundancy built in to perform bell state measurements. Of course, there's the catch that here I need to measure these qubits in the Z basis to get rid of them. But if I don't have, sorry, if I don't have them, then that's a problem. So what I need to do is actually I need, um, I need to somehow build in uh, uh, error uh, or uh, loss uh, tolerance into these qubits. So I don't suffer errors by just not having them there and not having them available to measure. And that's why the inner qubits actually need to be uh, encoded. So that's why I use this orange color here to denote logical encoding. And if you remember from a few slides ago, the way these are presented is by these trees. So green are physical qubits, photons, and orange are um, inner qubits. And I, I can lose these ones, but I don't, I don't want to lose the inner ones. So from, if I actually try to write this as a graph, you see how complicated it starts to look because now I'm replacing each of these inner qubits with this tree structure over here. And this is my one logical qubit, the orange one over here. Uh, Sophia, quick question on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how would you know which path succeeded? Or I guess this, the slide before this. Yeah, so, so at this measurement node over here, um, I have, I need to have information. Let me maybe go one back. I need to have information as I receive the photons, I do need a way to mark them. So I need to know that this photon has, uh, you know, comes from, is connected directly to this one. I do need that information. So long as I have that information, all I need to know, uh, all I need to do is do an X measurement on this if this bell measurement succeeds. And then it doesn't matter you know, which one succeeds on the other side, because this guy's connected to all of them, as you see here. Does that uh, answer the question? Yeah, thank you. And then what, what, one more quick question. Can, uh, mm -hmm. can you briefly explain uh, why uh, Bell measurement is probabilistic? Yeah, so that goes back. Let me just go back to this. Uh, I think it was here. Uh, 
So the way linear optics works, um, I have this beam splitter uh, over here. And the way polarizing beam splitters work is like if I have rotation on the mode. So if you work out uh, what happens in, in the modes over here, you see that for two of the states, so th this, this is related to the way photons, um, uh, how photons, um, what, what kind of operations photons undergo when you pass them through linear optics elements. So you see that in some cases, they take the same path. This is when they have the same polarization and same um, uh, uh, mode, which is because of their uh, bosonic nature, right? So they go into the same uh, state. And then you cannot distinguish the two because they're identical. So there's no measurement you can do here once you've reached a stage where you can say anything about what uh, the state is. Another way to see it mathematically is that if I look at this, the difference between the phi plus and minus state is that there's a difference in the phases, but the, the setup doesn't know anything about the phases. It just measures uh, how many photons do I have in each mode with a given polarization. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we talked about the need for logical encoding. And the next thing, of course, you would be um, very right to wonder is how do I even obtain a state like this? So let me now spend the last few slides to talk about how people uh, propose and uh, attempt to generate photonic graph states. So one way uh, people have been obtaining bell pairs of photons for a very long time is using spontaneous parametric down conversion. Uh, what that means is you send a photon into some nonlinear crystal and you can get out, um, probabilistically you will get out a bell pair, which uh, you can view in a kind of atomic like diagram like this, you pump here and you have these two photon uh, emission and these photons are correlated. So you can send in one photon and get out two photons and you can generate entanglement this way. This has been a very standard way of doing it in the uh, quantum optics community. Another thing you can do is you can start from single photons and you can post select. So this goes back to the question we just had about the bell state measurement, where there's this probabilistic element to it. So you can think of, you know, as we saw in the very first uh, few slides, to do a bell measurement, you need to do a bell, uh, to, you need to, an entangling gate. So being able to do an entangling gate between photons and being able to measure in the bell basis is actually pretty much the same capability. So for the same reason, you know, this probabilistic nature of the bell measurement enters here as well. So I cannot deterministically take single photons and entangle them. But what happens is some of the times they will come out entangled. And the idea here is that if I take four single uh, photons and I pass them each one through, you know, put them in each of these four ports, then some of the time for uh, certain measurements over here, I will have uh, one photon coming out to say one prime uh, mode shown here and uh, be one prime at the same time. And then I know that if that happens, the state is entangled. So this is called you know, this is an example of post-selection where uh, this is a probabilistic operation, but I know when it succeeds. So, so long as I didn't lose photons, right? That's another caveat. And my photons made it in these input ports, then I can tell with 100% certainty that conditional on a given outcome here, I have uh, entangled photons, a bell pair coming up. And then I can use variations on the scheme. And uh, for example, uh, I can take now, one photon from each bell pair, let's assume you created a bell pair in uh, this way or this way, and assume you created two separate bell pairs. Then I can take one photon from each bell pair, pass it through uh, this optical uh, linear optic setup. And now again, in a probabilistic fashion, if this detector clicks uh, with one photon, then the other three have been fused together. And that's why this is called the fusion gate. And type one fusion gates are uh, grow clusters in this in, toward one dimension. There's also uh, more elaborate things you can do. There's type two fusion gate where you can 
um, fuse together uh, once you've generated long enough clusters, let's say linear clusters, you can fuse them together in this dimension. And then there's various tricks you can play. So you can create, in principle, um, I don't want to say arbitrary states because it's actually not arbitrary, but you can create uh, almost any state you would want this way. Of course, this has the big overhead of the probabilistic nature. And you see every time you uh, have a successful event, you pay this 50% or sometimes you can boost this uh, by some probability. Uh, at uh, uh, Psi Quantum, they, their primitive is three photon GHC states. And uh, the scheme, sorry guys, I forgot to put the reference here. This is a Varnava uh, Rudolph paper from also about 15 years ago. I'm sorry about that. I'll fix it if, if anybody wants a copy of the slides later. So here you start from six uh, single photons and with a very low probability, you can get a three qubit GHZ state. So being able to create uh, photonic graph states with uh, higher probability is actually a very important problem and it can boost these all these uh, quantum information um, um, schemes a lot, right, by, by uh, upping that probability. So uh, about 15 years ago, there was this paper that proposed the idea of using quantum emitters to generate photons sequentially. So here you want to use the fact that the photon can emit, uh, I'm sorry, that, that um, quantum system like an emitter can emit photons that are entangled to it and that the photons can also be entangled with each other. And let me just show you some examples of um, spin photon interfaces where you can generate entangled photons. Probably the most familiar is a lambda system where you start from two ground states, two lower levels that have some selection rule, let's say different energy or different polarization as shown here with an excited state. And then if I initialize my state in this excited state, and then I allow for spontaneous emission, I can get a bell pair. And this has been shown in many different experimental setups. I could have another scheme where I have, again, this is a single system, but I can put uh, my, my system in a superposition of the two excited states. And if, again, I have these selection rules, I can get um, a bell pair, but now I can pump it again. And the second photon will also be entangled with a spin and the first photon, and I can keep pumping and I can get the GHC state. And then uh, a variation of this that was proposed by Lunar and Rudolf was to actually also allow for a Hadamard gate. And what they showed in this paper is that if I uh, alternate this uh, spontaneous emission with a single qubit gate over here, I can actually obtain a linear cluster state. And there was an experiment by uh, Gershon's group, group at Technion where they showed that using a quantum dot, uh, you can actually, in principle, get the state. Um, it, it has a lot of uh, things that need to be you know, improved experimentally, but it's still a very nice uh, demonstration and a challenging experiment. But people are following up on trying to do this with various quantum systems. Um, in, in our work, what we have proposed is to actually try to grow the state by using entanglement between emitters. And the idea is that by entangling emitters and allowing them to emit photons, then you can transfer that entanglement to the emitted photons. Um, so this is just a schematic of that. The entanglement you create between the emitters is transferred in the generation process. And we've also shown that you can use one emitter and one ancilla to generate uh, these uh, repeater states that I showed you for uh, quantum communication networks. And I'll just show you in a cartoon way what happens. I have an emitter and ancilla, I do a CZ gate, and then I emit a photon. I actually emit two photons from the emitter. And then I measure the emitter. So I use the properties of uh, how graph states act on their measurement, such that I disentangle the emitter, but I don't destroy the structure of the entanglement. And I have now attached my photons to the ancilla. And I can repeat this process to generate more arms. And when I reach the stage where I have enough arms, as many as I want, I can make a, a, I can do a Y measurement on the uh, Scylla qubit. And you see here is this local complementation idea I mentioned is that this one is removed, but all its neighbors become connected to each other. And that's exactly the state uh, we need for, for um, networks. And my very last slide, is to show you that, of course, as I told you, you also need the inner qubits to be encoded. And we can do that by adding uh, more emitters. So if I really want this state, 
then we have a way that scales linearly uh, with the number of emitters to generate, to do basically operations between the emitters and pump them. And that way we can generate these um, tree structures. Of course, this is a theoretical proposal, um, but uh, people are working on these things experimentally where you can generate this tree structure, uh, have it anchored to some emitter, and then uh, by repeated pumping and uh, entangling gates, you can create uh, the encoded version of this uh, repeater state. So with that, I'll just uh, leave you with some uh, review papers. These are on measurement-based uh, quantum computing. Uh, this last one is more on properties of graph states. Uh, the books are more for stabilizer formalism and uh, optical quantum information processing. And also uh, there's a nice video series uh, by uh, Rausendorf, which is one of the two inventors of uh, measurement-based quantum computing that you can watch. So uh, uh, with that, I'm I, uh, done and I can take more questions.